Não, você não imagina. Eu posso falar sobre alguém, uma coisa, e em inglês. Então, mas... Está funcionando. Tá? Ok, vamos lá? É... Então, uh, primeiro, obrigado para quem sobreviveu até a quarta aula. Em inglês. Ah, ok. But there is no this unique guy who uh, did not understand Portuguese. He is not here. Yeah, but, yes, but, but, but because we're recording this, it could be useful for... Uh, ah, okay. You know, physics happens in English, <laughs> but can you... No, you can, you can make it in Chinese, no problem. <laughs> I can make it in Chinese, but in principle is possible. Okay, let's go. So, uh, today, uh, it's most important uh, lecture because the course is about quantum gravity and there will be only one lecture about quantum gravity, this one. Okay, the rest will be about other things as you know. So, uh, so let us discuss uh, how we can quantize uh, metric, okay, and which kind of difficulties uh, we meet and which kinds, kind of achievements we can have according to Rogerio's original request. So, first of all, uh, in order to quantize gravity, we have to choose the action of gravity, okay? And the first thing is that I will work with action of metric, okay? Gravity can have some other fields like torsion, non-metricity, and so on, but uh, there is also supergravity with many other uh, particles but we will consider only uh, theory of metric. Uh, then, second thing, you have to decide exactly like in semi-classical approach how you define quantum field. And this is a first non-trivial moment because I can do several things. For instance, I can say G menu equal to eta menu plus H menu, okay? but I can choose another parameterization. For instance, there is very uh, popular parameterization like that. Phi menu. So uh, one can make this kind of thing and ask what will be the difference, okay? Also, uh, and you can, uh, you can imagine that this is just, uh, there are two examples, particular examples. I can make infinitely many parameterization of, of quantum fields because this difference between these two guys is uh, parameterization. Very good exercise for students is to find how H menu, phi menu can be expressed through H menu and vice versa, let's say, until second order, okay? If you go to higher orders, it's possible, but a little bit more difficult. Then, in reality, when we make calculations, we used to uh, applies the so-called background field method. Background field method means that you have G menu and you, instead of making it on flat background, you shift it to uh, sum of uh, a, uh, G menu and H menu. Once again, I can use different parameterization, parameterizations. And this is the background field, which is classical. And this is the quantum field. In fact, this is classical, but does not mean that uh, it is irrelevant because after all, we quantize H menu and then we get information about the action of background field. Uh, all this is not very complicated, but it's not also very simple because you, you need to uh, work a little bit to accustom with these things, okay? Second problem is that uh, gravity is a gauge theory. Gravity is a gauge theory. It doesn't matter which, which uh, action you have. When you make uh, the transformation of coordinates, okay, metric transforms in the following way. Okay, it's, again, it's a good exercise to obtain this formula. Okay, it's infinitesimal transformation, of course. Okay, then this is a gauge transformation. And uh, in principle, you can uh, use the standard scheme of quantization which people use for gauge theory. Typically, you use Fadeev Popov approach, or better say, David Fadeev Popov approach, because, by the way, Fadeev Popov method, of course, is the main thing uh, to learn about quantization of gauge theories. 
And originally, it was done by David in the paper on quantum gravity. This shows the importance of quantum gravity for general framework of gauge theories. And so you have to do, as usual, I expect everybody knows that, so you have to change S of G menu, okay, uh, to total action of G menu. And this total action is S plus H, H gauge fixing plus H uh, ghost. Okay, now S uh, gauge fixing is integral. I will make it in four dimensions. In principle, you can go to any dimension from two to any uh, if you like, okay? And this is, uh, let's say, one half chi uh, mu y mu nu chi nu, okay? Where chi nu is called gauge fixing, uh, and y is the weight functional, weight functional, weight function, or weight operator, maybe say. Okay, for instance, if we use background field method, then, and if, you, if we use linear gauge, okay, uh, in principle, it's not compulsory to use linear gauges. You can use nonlinear gauge, but usually people use uh, nonlinear linear gauge, so, so typically this is like NABLA, alpha h alpha mu minus beta nabla mu h. h is always uh, the contraction, okay? So contraction is done with the background met metric. And in principle, you cannot have anything else. And the choice of y menu, okay, is not easy. In order to choose y menu, beta is an arbitrary parameter of so the gauge fixing. But y, the choice of y, essentially depends on the action. So at this moment, I cannot do it for any action. I have to choose action. Why? Because what's the problem? If you have S, which is minus over kappa square, I will explain you why it is very usable. D for X, make it this way. Okay? You take Einstein-Hilbert theory. It's really good to put here kappa square. Of course, kappa square is nothing else as uh, 16 pg, okay? So it's just a useful way of making parameterization. Then it is nice to put here kappa square, and what happens? Then in the term which is quadratic in H, kappa cancels, okay? Kappa, kappa, yes, of course, sorry. Kappa, kappa cancels, and then the next orders, like cubic has kappa, third power has kappa square, and so on. So kappa becomes a uh, loop expansion parameter. So you can expand in H bar, as you can find in our book, for instance, in many other places, or you can expand in kappa, and the change between one and another uh, parameter is trivial. Now, uh, in this case, uh, if we make uh, the expansion uh, of uh, the action up to the second order in H, okay, to have propagator, you will see that the propagator is degenerate. Propagator is degenerate. This means that these five uh, tensor structures, which I show you in the last lecture, at the end of the last lecture, they combine in such a way that the matrix has no inverse, and you cannot find propagator. So the, uh, the purpose of introducing gauge fixing term, of course, is to kill the degeneracy. And since this theory is second order in derivatives, then I need that my gauge fixing is also of second order in derivatives, right? So uh, in this case, uh, this uh, uh, y can be like, like this, okay? There is no reason to make it more complicated, okay? Uh, if you have another parameterization of quantum field, things don't change much, so you just uh, have the same. So you have two parameters, alpha and beta. Immediately, we have the following question. We have uh, freedom to choose different parameterization of quantum fields, different parameterizations of quantum fields, and we have two gauge parameters. We can choose parameterization, arbitrary. We can choose gauge parameters to make our calculation simple, or if we are hardworking people, we can choose these parameters to make our calculations complicated. Can we take care about the difference between the expression calculated for one choice of gauge parameters and another choice of gauge parameters in one parameterization and another parameterization? And the answer is yes, we can. 
I will explain you later on how we do it. Okay? This is a good choice for this theory. Let's put it one, okay? And this, put it one here. I will put one here, it's first. Now imagine I have uh, another action. For instance, S2 equal S1 plus uh, this uh, action which we already discussed. Okay, so minus one over two lambda C square minus omega over three lambda R square, okay, plus, let's say, tau Gauss Bonnet plus gamma box R. So let's take, let's start constructing quantum gravity with a four derivative theory. In this case, things change a lot. In this case, there is no point to put here kappa because the uh, loop expansion parameter will be uh, square root of lambda, okay, square root of lambda. Then, of course, we <laughs> should better put here lambda or just make it like, like this and start to cancel after. And then the uh, uh, weight functional, the weight operator, sorry, weight operator can be much, diff much more complicated. Why? Because this is for derivative action, okay? The two chi's give you two derivatives, so this gentleman can give us four de uh, two derivatives also. So you may have one over alpha one g mu nu box plus uh, one over uh, alpha two nabla mu nabla nu plus one over alpha three r mu nu, for instance, okay? And I think, I think this is most general, I'm not sure, maybe you can put uh, also uh, change the order, I think it reduces, uh, reduces, reduce. so this must change, okay. So these are two examples, two examples, okay. You can take more complicated action for quantum gravity, I will discuss some choices today. And then you have to, in order to kill the degeneracy of the highest derivative term and to have propagator, you must change, change your weight function and make it more and more and more complicated, okay. Once again, in this case, we have gauge fixing parameters, even more, four parameters in this case, two parameters in this case. And uh, there is always a question how our results depend on the gauge fixing and how our results depend on parameterization. Okay? Now. Uh, can I just follow to make sure I, I understand. So you can, you can do this and, and you have all this freedom to try to simplify your life, but is the statement that if you have this four derivative action and you were to use the first, the gauge fixing with only two derivatives, that's not enough to break the degeneracy? No, of course not. I will explain you now. Let me do it in a few minutes. So now I will write for you a, a few more uh, for big for uh, the big formulas, okay? In principle, in quantum gravity, if you are going to work in quantum gravity, you should be ready to mess at some point with big formulas. So, but if you are smart, you can m mess with a, a reasonably big formulas. So this is a big difference. <laughs> so, so, and maybe maybe the, the question is not being smart, but the question is to have certain experience. So you have one over two, theta mu alpha nu beta plus theta mu beta nu alpha. It's flat background formula. 1 over 3, theta mu nu, theta alpha beta. And here, uh, theta mu nu is eta mu nu minus omega mu nu. And omega mu nu is k mu, k nu over k square. Okay? So this is the, uh, the 2 here means that this is projector to the spin 2 state. Spin 2 state. Okay? Then you have P1 menu alpha beta, which is one half theta mu alpha only omega ni beta plus, okay, then you make it symmetric in menu and alpha beta. Then also there are P zero S and P zero omega, and there are also two other terms which I will not write. So how it works? If you have theory which has gauge invariance, okay, but it is gravity, and it doesn't matter which uh, 
term you put here, if it is C square, if you remove C square, it's changed a lot. So it means that you have spin two part. Spin two part is not affected by gauge fixing, okay? But spin one part and uh, spin zero part is strongly affected by gauge fixing. So you basically have, if you don't put gauge fixing term, then you have the following situation. This with some coefficient, then uh, this uh, without coefficient, and one combination of these two also without coefficient. So the whole matrix is degenerate. When you add gauge fixing, you kill these degeneracy in the highest derivatives. Okay? In the highest derivatives. Well, I answered. Well, uh, uh, uh -huh. so I still don't see why uh, uh, having the gauge fixing the derivative is not sufficient to. Because, uh, good, good, good. The, okay, you, I agree. You want to kill the spin one and spin zero degrees of freedom in the matrix. Yeah, yeah, Those but I, I, want, I want to kill it in the highest derivative terms. Yeah, but, so, so you're, but those are associated with additional uh, gauge invariants, gauge symmetries, or? No, you kill, you kill gauge, uh, gauge invariants. If you put, if you take this weight function for this action, yes. you kill gauge invariants. This, this is true. Formally, your propagator uh, exists. You can calculate it. Yeah, yeah, you kill the degeneracy, yes. But you kill it in a very bad way, let's say. No, okay, okay, I understand, okay, I understand. So uh, he, he is right. So Edward is right, because in principle you kill degeneracy. But I don't think uh, you, in reality, you can make calculations with it, I would say, okay? But uh, degeneracy, in some sense, you kill, okay? You have to be very careful, because when you have higher derivatives, you have more degrees of freedom, okay? You have higher derivative degree of freedom and lower derivative degree of freedom. They are uh, somehow separated. But, but, but and they are also gauge degrees of freedom or they have some? No, 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 I mean, f uh, of course gauge, yes. Physical degrees of freedom are typically spin two in Einstein gravity and one of these spin zero guys in four derivative gravity. What, what I mean, is, is there some local gauge invariance beyond I mean, that is Specifically associated with the new degrees of freedom that enter before the derivatives, or is it no, just no, the usual no. If if you put all these terms, no. If you remove this term, you have conformal symmetry, and conformal symmetry uh, with this guy is softly broken conformal symmetry, which is hard to deal with. I would say it's not easy thing to do. Nobody made calculations ever in this theory. I I, I can do it, but it's not easy. Huh? No. <laughs> well, up to some extent, yes, because you have this uh, guy and he is his symmetry. But the theory has, exactly as you said before, the theory in general action has no conformal symmetry. But it is softly broken conformal symmetry. So, uh, as I said, uh, I know how to do this calculation in this theory. But uh, I would say that uh, may maybe I'm wrong when I say that I know. So I never tried, and this is something. <laughs> It's like some, something which is challenging, but nobody does it because nobody wants to do it. But in principle, it can be done, okay? I, I think it can be done, technically. But it will, not be, it will be much more difficult than to calculate in this theory, which was also not easy, okay? So, uh, yeah. By the way, since I started to speak about calculations, the first ever calculation in quantum gravity was done for this theory without cosmological term with scalar field by Hoft and Weltman. Okay, but Hoft and Weltman in 1974. It is probably most famous paper on quantum gravity. Then this was in the same year, it was Deser and uh, Van Nieuwenhuizen. I don't remember how to write, <laughs> 74 also, okay? And there were many, many papers. The last paper was uh, by our group. Uh, we calculated in absolutely arbitrary parameterization of quantum field. You can take one of the, my last papers and you will see how it works. You can take at one loop, there is maximally uh, <laughs> available parameterization and the calculation is not complicated. Actually, it's easy calculation because as I said, I have certain experience. <laughs> so, and, and, but people calculated with completely arbitrary gauge fixing, 
for this theory, it is Kalashtaras of Tutin 78, okay, which was heroic calculation, very complicated. And, uh, and some other, m many other calculations has been done in this theory. In this theory, uh, the first calculation was done in 70, in 79, I think, or 78, by Hulven and Tonin, and they made exactly this mistake. They forgot that this term gives independent contribution. Then it was corrected by Fratkin and Seitlin, and then it was corrected by Barvinsky and Aramidi because Fratkin and Seitlin had some uh, calculational mistake. But it is, Fratkin and Seitlin, actually, I would say it's the best paper on higher derivative of quantum gravity, maybe in quantum gravity in general. It's a very, very good paper. Doesn't matter that they make this mistake. Mistakes are very good because other people, people can correct them, including myself. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then we check it with Guilherme Pichotto, all this. Uh, it took a lot of time to check, but we have, finally we were sure that we did it correctly. And then after us, many other people, like Roberto Percacci, recalculated and other people. So, so in this theory, also there are nowadays like five, maybe seven independent calculations. Good, in different versions. Uh, yeah. So uh, we need gauge uh, ghost. Okay, ghost is, uh, as usual, is d4x square root of minus g c bar alpha m alpha beta c beta and m m uh, alpha beta is uh, delta chi alpha over delta h mu, and here are mu uh, beta, where this is the generator of the gauge transformation. Not exactly this one, because you need generator for quantum field, okay? And uh, this is a rational derivative. There are some modifications in this section because you can like to include, inter, inc introduce here certain power of y to make things homogeneous. I will discuss this later, but just remember this, what I said. Okay, so at this moment, we came to the point when we need to stop. Why? Because in principle, uh, the scientific development in this area goes like that. I have to uh, write BRST transformations. I have to derive either uh, slavnov taylor identities or anti-bracket with batalin wilkowski formalism and uh, makes this full-scale proof of gauge invariant renormalizability. And I certainly will not do it because it's not possible to do it in one action, okay? So you have to trust me, okay, that uh, this can be done. Uh, the most complete proof of this kind in the background field formalism has been published by Lavrov and myself as for, for a while it is a preprint, we are trying to publish it in the journal, it's not easy, okay? And myself, it is uh, 1903 and something, okay? So it's, it was sent to archive uh, one month ago. So, um, yeah, uh, for gravity, we, we did it for arbitrary model of quantum gravity and uh, in the background field formalism, which is, in my opinion, it's better than was done before. Actually, a very, very complete proof was done by Stella in 77, but it was done exactly for this theory, for four derivative gravity, okay? Uh, there are small details in the proof. Almost all proof can work for any theory, but small details in this proof are specific for this theory. So uh, if you want to generalize it for, even for this one, okay, then you have certain problems. There are very small problems, I would say. Okay, then there were paper, uh, papers, two papers by Voronov and Tutin uh, in 82 and 84, okay, and well, our last, which I mentioned. In principle, this proof is quite general. It is exactly of the same sort as people do for gauge theories. If you, just a second, if you take second volume of Weinberg's book, okay, you will see the very good proof based on homology uh, solution by NO, Brandt and Barnich, uh, and it is basically, it can be applied here in gravity, but if you compare with our work, you will see that this is more clear, let's say. Please. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, it's 2003, right? Because you are not so old. 
You are complete. You are completely right. It's not, yeah, yeah. It is two. No, it is number of our hive. I wanted to give, no, I'm sorry, but maybe I, I was too fast. Let me, no, you, you did not get it. Yeah, it is, no, it is 1902-04687. Okay, <laughs> so, so it's not year. Okay, better this way. <laughs> so, so, but good, good, good. It was nice. Sorry, so this paper, so basically, the, uh, you go over the BRST type of arguments. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it is based on BRST, and uh, the method is battalion Wilkowski quantization. Battalion Wilkowski, which is anti-bracket. Okay. These people did it in '82, and then Weinberg and Gomez rediscovered this in '95, '96. So. If uh, then it is all fixed, I mean priorities. If you take Weinberg's uh, second volume, it's all 100% correctly said, who we made and so on, okay? So, good. So, the next question is, so what we can prove in this paper, which I uh, removed, okay? So, and what uh, uh, actually Kelly Stella proved in this uh, seminal important paper was the following. That in principle, not in principle, yeah, you can, if you have this theory, you can uh, calculate uh, uh, effective action, okay? Effective action. And effective action is classical action plus gamma one plus gamma two, okay, with h bar here, h bar square, plus etc. okay? And uh, the proof of Stella says that the divergences of all the inner loops are covariant, are covariant, okay? If you go to our paper, you will see that even if starting action is non-local, okay, not only divergences, but even finite parts are covariant, which is basically, as I said, not a big difference because you can use the same Slavnov-Taylor identities, they have the same. But as we did, it's more clear, especially because it concerns also background field method, which is non-trivial which is non-trivial. Uh, now, now this fact I will not prove. I will not prove this fact. Instead, I will do something very, very simple. I will now uh, analyze one by one the candidate theories to be quantum gravity and show how looks the power counting in these theories. Because it's not sufficient that the gamma one, gamma two, and so on are covariant, okay? You need also to have correct power counting to have renormalizable theory. So let us do this. Questions? No, okay. So, but I will probably go here. With power counting. So the general formulas for power counting, curiously, I remember big formulas, big formula and small formula. Big I remember and small not. Small I need five minutes to, oh, here. Thanks, Jessica, you made great work. <laughs> so, so let us write the general formula for power counting. So it is D plus D, okay, equals to sum over L internal. I use the same notations as Stella, minus RL, minus 4N, plus 4, I will explain what these letters mean, and sum over nu, K nu. In this formula, capital D is the superficial degree of divergence of the given diagram, okay? So if capital D is zero, the diagram has logarithmic divergences and no quadratic divergences. If capital D is positive, then you have quadratic divergences. If capital D is negative, you have finite diagram, okay? Now, small d. Small d is the number of derivatives of the metric in the external lines of the diagram in the external lines of the diagram, okay? Remember that power counting in quantum gravity is very simple compared to, let's say, scalar theory of QED. Why? Because metric has no dimension. So if your contour terms have dimension of mass square, you must be sure that, and it is local, you must be sure that this is this. If it is four, you must be sure that this is this, and so on and so forth. So power counting in gravity is essentially sim simplest possible, okay? So this is number of derivative, derivatives in the external lines of the diagram. Now, 
RL is the power of momenta in the inverse propagator. For instance, for this theory, RL is 2. For this theory, RL is 4, if you include both these terms. Okay? If you put more derivatives, like 6 derivatives, you will have RL equal to 6. Okay? N is number of vertices. 4 is, sorry, this must be plus. 4 is a 4, which comes from the last integral. And K nu, is this is sum over vertices, and K nu is the number of derivatives in the vertex. Number of derivatives in the vertex. So, for example, if you have vertex which comes from these terms, then K nu is 4. If you have vertex which comes from this guy, the K nu is 2. And if you have vertex with cosmological constant, K nu is 0. Okay? So this formula tells you how much, uh, how divergent is your diagram. But it is not uh, usable if you don't include, introduce a second formula. It is P plus N minus 1. Here L int is the number of internal lines, number of internal lines. N is number of vertices, and P is number of loops, number of loops, okay? Uh, I use these notations uh, because when we wrote the book in 92, I took uh, a paper of Stella and opened all calculations, uh, practically all, okay? And uh, he, since he used these notations, I got accustomed. So people usually use a little bit different. Now, this formula, if you never did it, it's very good exercise to prove this formula you need like 15 minutes. It's, topo it's to called topological relations. That's just draw a diagram of your choice, doesn't matter which, and <laughs> check that this formula is satisfied. Then add internal lines, vertices, and so on, you will see that this is always correct formula, okay? But you can, to prove, you need a little bit more effort, and uh, for, for this reason, I say 15 minutes, not five. And you uh, even will find that there is one single diagram which violates this relation, <laughs> okay? But it's an irrelevant diagram. Okay, good. So. If we combine these two formulas, what will happen? Let's start with uh, Einstein-Hilbert theory, so general relativity, okay? In this case, you have D plus D equal to 2L in, okay? Because this 4 minus 2 is 2. You multiply by the number of internal lines, and you have 2L in minus 4N plus 4. And here I will take only the vertices with two derivatives. Why? Because if I put vertex with cosmological constant, the number of derivatives will decrease, obviously, okay? So we tell, always take simplify things and take maximal number of derivatives. So there will be two uh, n here, okay? So now we can use here this formula. And we have, we have p, 2p plus 2n minus 2 minus 4n plus uh, 4 and, uh, ah, uh, and, yeah, and plus 2n. Ah, perfect. It worked. So you see that n cancels, okay? And by the end of the day, we have 2 plus 2 pi. What this, this is all we need to know about quantum gravity, let's say. Because what it means? It means that at one loop, when p equal to 1, the number of derivatives in the logarithmically divergent diagrams are four. Since, according to Weinberg theorem, you always have local counterterms, it means that the counterterms in the theory one can be at one loop of the type one and also of the type two. Okay? This shows that this theory is non-renormalizable. This theory is non-renormalizable. If I go to second loop, take p equal two, then it will be six. So you have a two loop, you have six derivative uh, divergences. And six derivative divergences are interesting, especially interesting, because in the first paper by Hoft and Welkman, which uh, I mentioned, they uh, found, they made this calculation, they calculated this uh, famous uh, 7 over 20 r mu square plus 1 over 120 r square. It was counter term for Einstein gravity calculated for the first time in the simplest possible uh, parameterization in this one, 
in the simplest possible gauge fixing. And they notice that if you go on shell, this structure disappears. So it means that one loop S matrix in Einstein gravity without cosmological constant, of course, is finite. And then people took it very seriously. So everybody here except me are young, but when I was young, I still uh, met many people who said that gravity is so special, it is a sacred theory. I use other wording, of course. So maybe, maybe by some miracle, at all loops, gravity will have finite uh, two loop S matrix and five loop X matrix and so on will be always fine. But no, uh, then came people called Gorov and Sagnotti and they calculated two loop and they found the following counter term. Okay, and this counter term does not vanish on shell at two loops. Okay, so the story ended here. For, uh, uh, the bad part was that <coughs> I was calculating the same thing at that time with my partner, and uh, we just were uh, late. <laughs> so we, we were, we, there are two diagrams. We did use different methods, and we were just uh, late because we calculated one diagram, and second, we did not finish, and this paper came. Uh, actually, if it would be now, I would finish my calculation and publish it. But at that time, we thought, okay, uh, there is nothing to do. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so it was 86, 86, this paper of Gorov and Sagnotti. Then uh, some uh, researcher from Holland, Dutch country, uh, confirmed this independently by the method, essentially the same as we tried to use, uh, uh, the Ven. He calculated and he confirmed the coefficient. And recently, there is a guy in Israel who works on maximal supergravity, N equal 8 supergravity, uh, Zvibern, if I'm not wrong. And he recently also con con confirmed this coefficient. So Gorov and Sagnotti did not make mistake. So what we can say is the following. This theory is non renormalizable In practice, what it means? Uh, you have one loop counter term, you add uh, one loop divergence, you add four derivative counter term and cancel it. Okay, you need to fix renormalization condition. You fix it in according to your, go, stay, uh, like the, your will. Then in the next loop, you have uh, six derivatives. You kill these coefficients and go ahead. Next uh, loop, you have eight uh, derivatives. So the, the divergences look like two pages of formulas. You kill all of them. And so on. But remember that every time you kill one coefficient, you need an experiment to fix the cave to fix this. So in this theory, you need formally, formally, I will tell you another possibility which is called effective field, uh, gravity, uh, effective approach to gravity tomorrow. So formally here, you need infinitely many experiments to make predictions. Okay? So general activity is not, in this sense, is not a good theory to make quantum gravity because it is non renormalizable. And as the candidate for fundamental quantum gravity, it is not perfect. It's not perfect. Okay? Questions? Perfect. <laughs> so let's go to the next, to the next theory. Now let's, can I erase this? Because I don't like to erase the rest for a while. Okay? So next theory is uh, four derivative quantum gravity. Four derivative quantum gravity. Actually, it makes sense to go to four derivative quantum gravity. Okay, four derivative quantum gravity, this theory which is on the blackboard S2. It makes a lot of sense to start with four derivative quantum gravity. Why? Because we already know that in semi-classical gravity, if you quantize only matter fields, anyway, you need these terms. So, uh, so we, it's somehow natural to start with S2, okay? It's quite natural to start with S2. In this case, power counting is completely different because RL is four and K nu is four for the maximally divergent diagrams. So we have D plus D equal to, this guy cancel because four minus four is zero. So you have four minus four N, okay, plus four N, and so we have four. Four is a ni nice number because four, it means the following, it means that uh, counter terms which you meet in any loop order are at most four derivative. So the, since they are also covariant and local, so it means that your action uh, is reproduced in the counter terms. 
this theory is renormalizable. You can calculate quantum corrections uh, to anything you want, to any process, quantum process, any scattering, okay? No, 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 with the, uh, no. The diagrams can be, if you have one vertex through is R, okay, then what happens? If you have one vertex with R, then you, you have here, instead of 4n, you have uh, 4n minus 1 plus 2. And then your uh, power counting will give you 2. It means that one vertex of R gives you counter term of R. Sure. Yeah, because I did not uh, include the vertices with cosmological constant. I could do it. Because you did not ask. The, the R terms that you analyzed before. I? That, okay. When you consider that, before you, you showed us that diagrams with vertices with output of, of R only, the two derivatives, yeah. at a n loop order can generate a n, n derivative terms. Sure. No, Eduardo, it's very, yeah? So, so in what sense when you say you have, your theory is one process to, can you say it's renormalized? Let me repeat what I said. I said the point. In each case, it's useful, useful, not, not compulsory at all, to put, take only diagrams which have maximal possible divergence. If I put vertices which have less divergence, okay, I will have less divergence. For instance, remember that in Einstein gravity we have d, let's take d equal to 0, okay, for simplicity, then you had d equal to 2 plus 2p, p is number of loops. But if you have one vertex with lambda, one single vertex with lambda, this will be minus 2. If you have two vertex, okay, you can put here number of new lambda. So why not? You can do it. But it doesn't change things at all because the renormalizability is defined by the maximal di diversion diagrams, not by the minimal. Okay, maybe I need, I'm not understanding your statement exactly. So you, you take your theory F1 process 2, then you compute diagrams. Yeah. And you're saying the counter terms you find are always of the type of, of these two lines? Or, or yes, exactly. If you take that, uh, vertices, which are, no, look at this formula. You don't need to worry about this. This is the result. So we took here only the vertices from four derivatives. And you have four. If I take one single vertex with two derivatives, then I have to remove here n, take minus one. And instead of four n, I have four n minus one plus two, which is, of course, four n, uh, four n, uh, minus two. So, so, so you're not going to change the sum because four minus RL. Yeah, because I took I took in this calculation I took K nu K nu equal to four. No, I'm talking about the other sum. The one the four minus R L here. was zero here, but with the with the vertex the No 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 this is not a vertex. This is the inverse power of momentum in the propagator. Ah okay okay. This is not a vertex. I Good, good, good. Well, uh, uh, wait a second. I, I, this is very interesting uh -huh. point. If you do not include this guy, let's think. You just take the theory which you mentioned, just uh, softly broken conformal gravity, okay? So you put this guy and don't put this guy. What happens? Disaster, complete disaster. Why? Because then your propagator is non-homogeneous. Uh, then you have, in the spin two sector, you have propagator of one over K4. But in the scalar sector, you have propagator one over K2. According to our politics, we have to take here the maximally divergent diagrams. So the bad diagrams will be all from scalar sector. And they will kill you. <laughs> so it is, this theory is much worse in realization properties than Einstein gravity, because it has four derivative vertices and two derivative propagators. And then you can expect that one loop, a uh, hell of counter terms, much worse than in general TV. Okay? Of course, if you just take this theory and remove C square, it will be exactly the same. So these theories, the, from the point of view of renormalization, these two theories are really bad. Okay? They may be very good from other points of view, but for renormalization, they are disasters.
S1 plus S2 is renormalized. Yeah. But you need these two coefficients uh, non-zero. Just as one is non-renormalizable, non as I show you. But so the crucial step, I think, to, to appreciate is that is this thing of oh, using the propagator that includes all the quadratic terms that you see around. That includes this. Yeah. Uh, so it, go, it decays faster than one over t squared, sure. and that's what's improving the, the yield of your. My friends, I am telling something extremely simple now. Okay. So Eduardo is doing the right thing. He asked questions when he did not understand. Everybody must do it. Because this is something you can understand if you make questions. So why you did not ask when I was telling about Einstein gravity? You should, okay? Be no, active. I understood that the rest was normalized, but I was just curious of why including S2 would give you a... Because, when, very good question. When you include S2, then the power counting changes because First of all, RL instead of 2 is now 4. All propagators have RL equal to 4. Okay? And this changed the game, absolutely. Also, the vertexes, the vertexes you have with 4. But altogether, this changed the game. You may naively think that if I put 4 derivative here, 4 derivative here, nothing changes. No, it changes. You just, I did calculation for you. I can repeat it if you want. So in this case, for uh, this is uh, four derivative, okay? The result is four, max, maximal divergence. And for Einstein gravity, for Einstein gravity, JR, okay? You have D plus D is two plus two P, two pi. Okay, so it's completely different power counting. Okay? So S1 plus S2 could be a theory of, sorry, you know that you know it was S1. So S2 is a theory of, could be a fundamental theory of quantum gravity. Could be, if we are lucky, but we are not. <laughs> okay, this is the next thing I will explain. Okay, please. The, the propagator of this thing to center, if you split up into the massless uh, mode and the mass liquid. This is what I will tell next. No, let, let me let me do it that first. Is, is no, simple. no, I prefer to explain it first. Just because then, if you have one over t squared there, how can you? One over what? One over t squared. What, what is q? For the mode. So then. No, let me explain because you you don't let me write a formula. How I can answer your question? Okay, eh? It's not possible. I I, I it's, it, if I give lectures on philosophy, I could answer with words. If I give lectures on music, I could sing something, but I, I believe that if I start to sing, everybody will run away. So it's, it's, not, it's not a good choice. <laughs> so, well, I like when I sing, if you want. <laughs> so, but nobody else likes, this is a problem. <laughs> so, so, okay. So now, uh, answering your questions, why this theory is not a perfect candidate to be the theory of quantum gravity? And the reason is the following. If we look to the propagator of this theory, then we have the following situation. G of k equals to P of 2, P2. P2 is this uh, projector to the spin two states. And here we have k square, k square uh, plus m square. m square is, it's a Euclidean for simplicity, okay? A m square, m square is uh, proportional to Planck mass. Okay, plus there is also spin zero part. Spin zero part, and depending on gauge fixing, you may also have spin one part and so on. Let us just think about this part. You can rewrite what, uh, how, what's your name, by the way? Iberi. Iberi. What Iberi asked, it, you can do the following. You can write P it is the following way. One over K square minus one over K square plus M square, okay? And yeah, yeah, maybe I, I have to put here m square, right? Maybe m2, even better, m2, because it is spin two particle. Okay, it is spin two particle. One, one yes, exactly. P2 m2 squared, yes, perfect. Now, uh, what it means, if 
uh, propagator means the quadratic part of the action. So if you, uh, you, you can introduce auxiliary fields and separate these two modes, and what you will discover is that this mode is a graviton. It is normal spin two particle without mass. And this is massive spin two particle, but it has negative kinetic energy. And the particle depends. If you can, ch you can choose your coefficients, if you change coefficient of lambda of this coefficient to positive, it is ghost and also tachyon. Ghost and also tachyon. So this is ghost, okay, and maybe also tachyon if you make a mistake in choosing sign. For instance, a few years ago, I was in Geneva uh, in university visiting, and there was a student, and we started with her some crazy project. We, went, we found that uh, at low energies, due to contributions of air, of photon, which is the only uh, particle which contributes at uh, zero energy because it's massless, uh, this sign of lambda changes, it runs. And we calculated the time when ghost, normal ghost, becomes tachyonic ghost, because at that moment the universe should explode. Because tachyonic ghost means that gravity becomes completely un crazy, unstable. And the, we calculated the time which remains until the end of the universe, which was 24,000 uh, billion years. <laughs> so, but finally, I spoke to some colleague, and he explained me that there is a possibility of mistake, and we really found a mistake in interpretation. I used exactly this, what you already know, anomaly induced action. And this is an induced action for the sitter because it is all the uh, future of the universe is the sitter. On the sitter, it doesn't work. <laughs> so you cannot calculate in this way the end of the universe. It's, it's a pity. <laughs> so, good. So, your questions? So, M2 depends on lambda. Huh? Depends on lambda also. M2 depends not just on. Yeah, of course. Lambda. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's uh, basically, it is Planck divided by square root of lambda or multiplied, I don't remember by heart, okay? So this is ghost. So usually the word ghost, of course there are Fadiev Popov ghosts like this, but this ghost has nothing to do with the Fadiev Popov ghost. Why? Because Fadiev Popov ghosts are designed never go out of the loop. They violate spin statistics theorem, but they live inside the loop, they never show up, and that's why we're happy, right, with them. This ghost is different. It can propagate. Now imagine what happens if in the world there is one single particle with negative, negative kinetic energy and non-zero mass, let's say Planck mass. Planck mass is not a small thing, as I explained to you. It's 10 minus 5 of gram, okay? It's piece of, uh, you can have some particles of this kind in the air, of but this much, mass. Much bigger, no, no, not Planck size. <laughs> this is true, but anyway, it is some reasonable mass. Now, the particle with negative kinetic energy, it wants to do what? According to the minimal action principle, it wants to accelerate because it makes its energy smaller, right? So it will accelerate, and it cannot accelerate if the system is isolated. If you have the free fields, then it cannot accelerate because of the conservation of energy. But in gravity, you are never alone. You are ever, always accompanied by the lot of gravitons. So this particle can accelerate emitting gravitons and scattering gravitons. Uh, Weltmann, Weltmann wrote in 63 the paper about that. I think it was his first paper. I read this paper many years ago. It's a big, very complicated quantum paper about scattering of particle with negative kinetic energy, very heavy, and light particles with positive kinetic energy. And the result of Weltmann was the following that uh, typical uh, cross-section of the process is that this negative energy particle accelerates, emitting more and more, uh, or scattering a more and more and more uh, light positive energy particles. In our case, since we are in quantum gravity, it means that this guy will accelerate. And when it accelerates, remember that energy is mass over square root of 1 minus beta square. So its energy becomes more and more and more greater, okay? And as more is energy of this particle, more gravitons it will emit. So after a very short while, this particle will become infinitely energetic and will emit infinitely many gravitons. And we are done. 
So we cannot live in the universe because this particle will destroy our universe. One single particle like that means that the, something is wrong, let's say, completely, because one single particle of this kind can finish with everything. So, and we live, we, this is a matter, as a matter of fact, we can exist. So it means that something in this scheme is not working, thanks to <laughs> nature, okay? So something in this scheme is not working. So, as you said, this theory is perfect candidate for quantum gravity, yes. For if this theory is correct theory for quantum gravity, then something does not let ghost to exist, okay? Which we don't know why, what? If this theory is not the theory of quantum gravity, then we have to explain what to do with higher derivatives, because remember that four derivative terms appear not only in quantum gravity. You may say, I don't like to quantize gravity. I don't believe all these quantum people who from 60s say that this is mathematically inconsistent. I have my own opinion. I live very well with semi-classical gravity. No, because semi-classical gravity requires you to have these terms too. And semi-classical gravity, as I explained in the first lecture, is something you cannot avoid. You have to deal with semi-classical gravity. Do you want or not? So you have uh, two uh, different conflicting, let's say, requirements. One is the theory must be renormalized, at least a semi-classical theory. And second, uh, it means that the ghost, you, you, you cannot survive with ghost. You have to get rid of ghost. So as you can imagine, there were many papers trying to solve this problem, okay? The first historically one was by uh, Tambolis. It's a very well-known physicist from Los Angeles. And he did the following. He uh, analyzed the quantum corrections to this propagator, and he showed, it was 77, that the, this massive pole is splitting into two complex conjugate poles due to uh, exactly corrections of uh, vector field in the so-called one over n approximation. If there are phenomenologists, they know what is one over n, over n approximation. Then, in this, uh, one year after, Salam and Stredi also did this, uh, see very similar work, and they, uh, at that time, papers were published slowly, so I, I can imagine that they did not know even about Tambolis. I think they don't cite him. So they have very good detailed uh, also the, uh, discussion of the same thing. So what happens if you split the pole? Then there were two other papers of Tambolis, and there was paper of Antonianis Tambolis in 86, with small mistake, I would say. Uh, and uh, one year after, there was paper by the guy called Johnson, and he wrote a paper which is called Sedentary Ghost Poles in Higher Derivative Quantum Gravity. And he has shown that everything what other people uh, climate is uh, not wrong, but it is also not correct in the following sense. He has shown that one over n approximation, lattice arguments which uh, Tambolis used, and other, 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 are not sufficient. He, he has <laughs> in this paper the following result. Maybe, maybe he says, this works what you want with complex poles. But for this, you need a uh, dressed propagator exactly. You cannot work with one loop, two loop result. One over n is not reliable, and so on. And he has shown it short, very nice paper. So we are here in the four derivative quantum gravity. We are exactly in this situation uh, that consistency of quantum theory is uh, not completely, uh, uh, let's say, guaranteed that it doesn't uh, work. Maybe it works. But, but things are worse than that because we cannot guarantee that the theory is correct. And unfortunately, this is not the main problem of this theory with four derivatives, no. Because long before Weltman, there was a paper of, of some uh, mathematician, Astrogradsky. Okay, it was 1850, uh, 50. okay? He was very famous, he worked in, he was from Ukraine, but worked in St. Petersburg. And uh, he wrote a paper when he has shown in classical mechanics that if you put this, you can uh, easily uh, repeat this as an exercise in principle. He has shown that if you have four derivative system in classical mechanics, then it always develops exponential instabilities. So you basically can expect some exponential solutions in this theory. So uh, if you take, uh, who writes uh, many, uh, a lot about this and has very, I would say, very extremist positions is Richard Woodard. 
Woodard, okay? Woodard has a very nice paper about Ostrogratsky, including uh, uh, bi biographical part and so on, and he explains this very well, why the ghost should be forbidden. Unfortunately, he does not understand the second part, or doesn't like probably to understand. I hope he will see this. <laughs> so, because I, I tell this to him also. That without these terms, you cannot have theory too. So you need uh, to put both things together. So, and, and, uh, and, uh, Of course, of course, of course, of course. Because, for instance, I can explain you. For instance, you take some uh, cosmological solution. Okay, so this is not a solution on because all you can do in uh, with ghosts on diagrams, like Welton Welton paper, is a quantum field theory on flat background. But gravity is not mechanic cl classical mechanics, and moreover, gravity has no much sense on flat background. Okay, gravity must be done on curved background. So typically, the main problem of this theory, okay, is the phone. You may say, okay, maybe what uh, this Johnson said in the sedentary ghost pulse is correct. Maybe dressed propagator gives us uh, imaginary pulse and it is all fixed. Why not? You can trust it. It's not bad to trust people, okay, or to trust something, especially because we don't explode, okay? <laughs> so, but the, the, the Astrogradsky instability, what uh, Richard is advocating, is completely correct, that if you have uh, higher derivative theory, you take some solution, like you take cosmological solution, black hole solution, and so on, you make a small perturbation in this theory. The solution itself at low energy may be completely uh, unsensible to these higher derivative terms. They are small, like today cosmology. Typical energy is 10 minus 42 GV, okay? So wh why I should worry about the particle which is 60 orders of magnitude heavier? No, you have to worry, because if you have a small perturbation, then due to higher derivatives, it explodes, and you have no your solution. Because when, when we find the cosmological solution, we do the following. We say, let's do work with this metric, okay? Like what I wrote in the first lecture, cosmological metric, or, or Schwarzschild metric. And then we find the solution of this type, okay? But remember that we did this assumption. We, we don't find arbitrary solution. So you have your star, and you find your Schwarzschild solution around the star, even if you are very far from the star, it's not black hole, it's a peaceful asteroid. You find <laughs> the gravitational field of asteroid 1,000 kilometers from the asteroid, which is 10 kilometers radius. Very good. You are very happy. But then you make small perturbations, and these terms give you growing mode, and your solution does not exist, a solution of general activity. It is a solution of your theory, which you invented, when you put metric of this kind. Understood? So this is what Woodard says in all papers. And this is correct, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, going back to my point, I, I was just wondering, so to me, it looks like uh, the oscillatic uh, instability is, uh, so this is a classical limit, of course, but it's essentially in a different language, by a different language, this goes instability before this, this uh, speculation about a, a, Splitting into complex things, which is mm -hmm. they go beyond that. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, okay, this is the, uh, the Osgrassian analysis should be the semi classical limit of this quantum theory, right? And they seem to be have, to have the same origin, namely, you are taking seriously the higher derivative equations of motion. Yeah. And that's also when you do what you do when you include the propagator exactly, including all the. Yeah. So, they seem to be closely related to me. Yes, okay. this is correct. Okay, so I this is to... correct. So, so this is uh, the big problem, the stability, okay? Uh, we, uh, some years ago, we started to deal with it uh, slowly, okay? We just trying to understand the stability of cosmological solutions. This is very easy, relatively easy. I wouldn't say very easy because uh, the uh, calculation of, you need to s look for the behavior of spin two modes on cosmological background. And if somebody works on cosmology, you know very well that this is very, very well elaborated issue. So we really know how to calculate gravitational waves on the cosmological background. And what we have found with, uh, at the beginning he was my student, Felipe Salles, okay, and then uh, 
first paper was with Anna Pilinson and Julio Fabris, then the critically important paper was with Felipe, and the last was with Felipe and Patrick Peter from Paris. Was the following. Uh, we took uh, cosmological solutions, actually, uh, for the sitter, for radiation dominated, for matter dominated uh, solutions, which do not, the background does not take this into account because it's low energy solution. Then we put into this uh, uh, system some gravitational wave. And we found some funny thing. If, if, uh, so the equations, I will not write you equations because they are big. Uh, in the transparencies, you can find some example. Actually, we did for this theory and for this theory corrected by anomaly, which I showed you yesterday. With anomaly, the equation is like two pages, maybe. But it, everything is, doesn't matter because the results are very simple. So you have k, the wave vector, and you have frequency, which is modulo of the k, okay? Then we found the following. If, if you put initial seed of the perturbation, if the k, okay, in the initial point, is much less than Planck mass, there are no growing modes. Everything is peaceful. If you put k initial of the order of Planck mass, then we see huge growing modes immediately. If we flip the sign, okay, uh, of this, of everything, what happens? Then graviton becomes ghost, it's massless, and the ghost becomes normal heavy particle. Then we see the exploding modes and any energies. What this means? Well, our interpretation was the following. In order to have one ghost alive, it is not sufficient to have one ghost in the spectrum of the theory. For instance, the vacuum in this room has all particles of the standard model. We know that. There are virtual particles of the top quark in this room. But you are know very well that there is not a single top quark in this room. Why? because it does not create from the vacuum. And we know why it is not created from the vacuum, because you need huge energy, okay? Of course, this logic does not apply to ghost, for otherwise it would be extremely simple. Why it does not apply to ghost? Because ghost has no negative kinetic energy. So you can imagine the following process. You create a ghost, okay, with neg energy negative, and then you create huge amount of gravitons, to have zero energy. This can run even on Minkowski background. So you have Minkowski, and it is unstable in this theory because it creates a negative energy ghost and a horrible number of gravitons. However, however, uh, if we do not put initial seed of perturbation of the Planck order of magnitude, we saw that this doesn't happen. What it means? It means that you uh, do not create this particle. You have no energy in the graviton to create this particle. If you put sufficient energy, then yes, you have uh, in ghost and instability. Okay? Unfortunately, this is not a solution of the problem. I'll explain you why. Second, second, second point. Uh, we tried first, we, we stopped on this, and then with Patrick Peter, we found even more interesting thing. Uh, I, I thought like that. There are uh, waves in the ocean, there are waves of 5 centimeters, uh, there are waves of 50 centimeters, of 5 meters. Maximal waves you can meet is 30 meters. Why we never have waves, wind blows, why we never have waves of 1 kilometer high? We, we know that this doesn't happen, For other, otherwise some cities on the seaside like Rio de Janeiro would suffer a lot, right? So, because this doesn't happen, okay? And the difference between normal physics and Planck scale is much more than the wave 30 meters and, 30 and one kilometer, much more. So there is some reason. There is some reason why this doesn't happen. And here we don't know this reason, okay? Uh, however, however, in cosmology, you can imagine that uh, initial seeds of perturbations of the uh, Planck origin uh, must be appropriate, let's say, if the background is very energetic. So you put uh, background, which is like inflation, very, very strong background, and we find the following. We find that this K enters the equations for the gravitational wave, not like K, but by Q. Q is uh, K over A of T, the, the 
conformal factor of the metric. You take any textbook on cosmology and it is uh, uh, written there. So what happens is the following. Even this mode, which is growing like crazy, if you take initial seed of uh, Planck, if you are in a sufficiently fast, ex fastly expanding universe, after a while, it just uh, stops growing. And we found this numerically. And analytically, we understood it very well. So once again, but this doesn't solve the problem of ghost. Of course not. Because the problem of ghost is not what happens with the initial seed of perturbation on, uh, with the under Planck frequency. The problem of ghost is not what happens with the high energy seed of perturbation if you have strong gravity. No. The question of ghost is why the initial seed of perturbation of 100 Planck magnitudes does not emerge in the flat universe or almost flat universe. In this we don't know, we have no solution. There were, were papers by Giad Valley and Gomez and some other people a few years ago. And they made the following. They made a kind of hypothesis. There should be a uh, law of nature, they say, which forbids concentration of gravitons with the Planck density. This is exactly what I need <laughs> to solve the ghost problem. If we find, they did not recognize this in the papers, but they just discussed some uh, statistical mechanics of the theory which, where this happens. So they said, imagine that there is a law of nature which says that uh, filling number of gravitons cannot be of the Planck order of magnitude. Then this process is forbidden, because in order to create one single ghost from the vacuum, you need uh, Planck concentration of gravitons, because this guy has Compton wave of graviton is uh, well, Planck length, of course, yes? So you need Planck concentration of gravitons here. If it is forbidden, we are safe. This will solve the problem. And if this forbidding rule is violated by a very fast, fastly growing background, then it's not a problem. Okay, you can open your, let's say, uh, phase space, but then because of fast growing, of fast, strong background, of other kind like singularity and so on. But this is, once again, not a problem because this does not grow eternally. It grows for a very short time, a few Planck times, and then it uh, stops growing. Yeah, so the end of the story is the following. If we want to solve this uh, in a reasonable way, the problem of Gauss, in, together with it, the problem of quantum gravity, we need something like this new law of nature, okay, which forbids Planck concentration of gravitons. I have no minimal idea how it can be done, so I don't know. I leave it to you, you are new generation, so maybe somebody can do it, okay? Uh, it must be some sufficiently crazy idea, I would say, okay? So let me comment on a few other possibilities which we have in this uh, series. Can, can you make a Sure. I'm just uh, thinking uh, so, somewhat critically about this. Uh -huh. So I agree. So this part here, so it's uh, uh, very consistent with the effective field theory way of looking at things, so it makes sense. Um, then, so it's sort of point that the, the ghost thing is something connected to the Planck scale, really. Sure. And then uh, you come up with something like that Valley's uh, rule that. Uh, some process like this is not allowed, or some, some property. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's, that's tantamount to, so this has to come from somewhere. So this is sounds tantamount to <laughs> assuming some physics mm -hmm. at that scale, yeah. which is sort of where the ghost is. So at the end of the day, it's not clear to me that you're advancing much. You're, you're, you're already where we knew. We were that we need some new physics at the Planck scale, and we don't know exactly what that. Is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we don't know at which the end physics. Of the day, this, this yeah. thing may not be the correct description even at that scale. It could be sure. Completely different. Yeah. So. Okay. Let me let you. So we will not solve it today. Believe me. So let me go ahead. So the next possibility is the following. Some people, uh, namely uh, Simon and Simon and Parker. The first paper was uh, Simon alone, and Parker is very famous uh, person. He one of the creators, founders of this area of physics. And they, uh, Simon basically, he did the following proposal. 
So he said that since this uh, action added to, gravi to gravi gravitational action creates ghost and instabilities, so we have to follow the pattern of quantum electrodynamics. In quantum electrodynamics, remember that when I uh, show you that you have action of one minus four integral, and then you have one plus log box over plus m square over mu square, okay? And f alpha beta. And I told you that if we take it like this box as a part of equation, dynamical equation, then we are in a very bad position because we need infinitely many boundary conditions for this theory because it's uh, non-locality. Moreover, moreover, depending on some scheme of calculations, you may have four derivative terms coming as quantum corrections in QED. And people in 50s discovered that in this case you have runaway solutions. Runaway solutions are exactly those Astrogradsky instabilities. So Simon said, why don't we do the same with gravity? We can say that this is the classical part of the action, and this is small correction. This and everything you can get from semi-classical quantum loop corrections with four derivatives, it is all small correction. People like Woodard and others, they said that this is standard approach to higher derivatives. So you calculate whatever you want with higher derivatives, but then you have to, by definition, take this guy as small correction at the moment when you look for your equation of motion. Is this working? Certainly, yes, it is very good. Moreover, the difference with what I said, with what I told you with this uh, story with perturbations is small. Until you come to uh, uh, try the initial seed of perturbations, k initial, of the Planck order, these two approaches are the same, basically. There is no real difference. This term is small anyway for low energies. But unfortunately, what we want from quantum gravity, as I explained in the first lecture, is not the theory for small energies. When you deal with energies of the Planck order of magnitude, we see that this uh, uh, classification saying that this term is small compared to this and can be treated as perturbation simply does not work. And the difference with QED is the following. In QED, this moment when this uh, cannot be treated as small effect comes at very high energy, something like uh, 10 to 100 GV or something like that. This is a zero charge problem, so-called, or Moscow zero problem of Landau. So this is not a small energy. This is something far, far, far away from us and <laughs> from the theory, let's say. And we know very well that already at uh, 10 to GV, the QED is not the theory. Then you need electroweak interaction. Then you have this uh, mixing with uh, W and Z bosons, and things change completely. So QED is simply uh, not the theory for high energy. It's theory for until 10 minus 12 centimeters. So, so this is a big difference. Moreover, uh, these higher derivative terms here are not required. Another way of do, saying the same, I would say is that here, these higher derivative terms are not required by renormalizability. And here they are required, even semi-classical level. So if you do not put these terms, let me repeat, then you have these terms anyway with diversion coefficients, and then it will be completely impossible to treat them as, uh, as uh, perturbations, as small perturbations. Of course, again, we can renormalize them, do everything, calculate quantum calculations, everything was perfect, Propagator is truncated here by definition. Very good. But then it works until Planck scale. At Planck scale, it doesn't work. In quantum gravity, if we really want quantum gravity for low energies, I would say it's better to do something else. We want quantum gravity as something which explains us uh, even Planck energies. So it simply does not work. Uh, so, sorry, okay. we uh -huh. were in love with that. Uh, for example, saying that corrections to Newton's law, if we, it's not possible, but if we could measure these things, it would be very interesting. Corrections to Newton law. For example. Ah, this is good. I can comment on this. Okay? So you see, this is, uh, you, you know, in Newton theory, in S1, you have the following potential, okay, which is uh, minus Gm over R, right? And it is singular at zero point. Amazing is that in this theory, in four derivative theory, the Newton potential is, let's say, modified Newton potential, is quite different. It is minus Gm, okay, uh, and uh, here you have uh, 1 over R minus 4 third 
exponential of minus M2R plus one third exponential uh, minus M0R, where uh, M2 is mass of the ghost and M0 is mass of the normal scalar particle, which is hidden in R square. So you see that in this theory, when you go to zero, you have no singularity. Singularity disappears. It is uh, the result from the paper by Stella, 77 or 78, I don't remember. I think, I think 77, okay? Now, so you see the singularity disappeared. Oh. You calculate Newton uh, potential. But, but, but the equation seems wrong dimensionally. Why? Ah, here is R, of course. I'm very sorry. Here is R. Thank you. Okay? So uh, we can do the following. We can, people try it, as I said, different approaches to kill ghost. And one of the first things was uh, to generalize the action and put more derivatives. This was discussed first by uh, people from Dubna, Krasnikov and Kuzmin in the 80s, but more or less qualitatively. No, exactly, but almost. Then uh, there was a paper by Arkady Zetlin, and he, uh, Zetlin, uh, one of the creators of string theory, and he noticed the following, that if we supplement the action. Instead of these terms, we can do the following. We can write graviton action as S1 of the same thing, maybe Einstein-Hilbert without cosmological constant. And then you can do the following. You can put here something like R mu nu and some, put here some form factor, okay, of box uh, over some scale, M square. And here you put G mu nu. G mu nu is Einstein tensor. And he noticed the following, that in principle, you can find such a form of this form factor. The paper was in 95. You can find such form of this form factor that your inverse propagator, G minus one of K, becomes K square multiplied by exponential of minus K square over some, uh, let's say, lambda. Lambda is dimensional parameter. This is fantastic, this is great, because uh, he, he did it as an application of string theory. I will comment uh, today in the second lecture on this from another viewpoint. But if you have this, things are solved. Because your propagator has, a, has only one pole at k square, right? Uh, then you can check that uh, phi, uh, let's say Zetlin Newton potential, is something like exponential of minus uh, R squared, so it is, I, I don't remember exact uh, formula. It's something, it's called error function. I really don't remember. I'll get somebody remember. I think it's integral, but I'm not sure. So something like that, so uh, near zero, where R goes to zero, so there is no singularity. And this was, um, paper was noticed like the uh, physics is called Ziegel. If somebody is from string theory, you know the name probably. Ziegel wrote in 2003, he got the same result. There is a preprint on the archive, but he never published it because probably he knew Satan and somebody told him about this. Recently, like six years ago, the same formula was rediscovered by some group of people and they published physical revelators with the same formula. Okay, these things happen sometimes. <laughs> okay, but then we had some discussions with them because I started to cite Satan and they were angry with me and finally, I wrote a paper and explained how things are in this theory. And things are in the following way. So this theory has no massive pole because you know that exponential of z equal to zero has no solutions, right? Is it true? No, it is not true. Because if z, z goes to minus infinity, then it is a solution, right? Exponential of minus infinity is zero, minus real infinity. So. Uh, if you take this theory with this propagator, inverse propagator, and put any quantum corrections to it, any quantum corrections, you can prove, and I proved in the paper, that uh, instead of this equation, you have something like exponential of z plus z square multiplied by log z. And this equation has plenty of complex solutions, plenty of complex solutions. 
So, and this is unavoidable. You can take my paper. It's called uh, Counting Ghosts in the Ghost-Free Theory. And you will see that uh, in this, you basically, even if you make your theory finite, you can make this theory finite. Okay, you always end up with this situation. Okay, maybe without logarithm, but Z square is always there. So you have a lot of complex poles. And correct interpretation is that this theory has infinitely many poles. Uh, poles, I mean uh, massive uh, ghost-like particles. But all these poles are hidden in the infinity on Z minus infinity. When you add anything here, okay, they jump out of, uh, jump, jump out of infinite point and distribute in a complicated way on a complex plane. So this theory is not, uh, does not solve this problem, at least in the part of existence of ghost-like states. There uh, is uh, my colleague and friend, uh, uh, Leonardo Modesto. Maybe he will come to our meeting in September this year. I'm not sure. He didn't respond yet. So he wrote a lot of his, this is his main business, working on these theories. And we have one paper with him, but now about different things. So, no, maybe two papers we have, yeah. So, <laughs> so, and Leonardo recently put to archive the paper uh, with another guy, uh, two papers actually, that saying that this theory has no problems with stability. If this is true, I could not understand what they wrote, but if this is true, okay, they solved the problem. Because the main problem, once again, is not complex poles, it is not nothing like that. The main problem is stability. And they say that stability of all solutions in non-perturbative stability is guaranteed. Okay, we can listen to him in September and see whether he convinces us or not, for instance. Now, this is the possibility to solve through non-localities. This non-localities now is a serious thing. So people, a lot of papers are published about non-local theories. And uh, because many people see it as a way out of this con conflict between renormalizability and uh, renormalizability and unitarity or stability. Let me say that in these non-local theories, typically form factor is exponential. So the question is how to calculate the power counting in these theories. And this was solved in the same paper of my, uh, is this uh, counting ghosts in the ghost-free theories. Uh, it turns out the following. If you want to uh, calculate in this theory the power counting, this formula is completely useless because this is infinite and this is infinite. So you end up with infinite minus infinite uncertainty. But topological relation alone gives you power counting because uh, it means that every vertex enters with positive amount of uh, exponentials of k. Every propagator enters with negative power of exponential. And so, actually, if you, your diagram has more propagators than vertexes, it is finite diagram, ultraviolet finite. If your diagram has more vertexes than propagators, it is uh, heavily infinite, okay? And you can figure out that using this formula, you can easily see that this theory is super normalizable if used for quantum gravity. Uh, and uh, all the versions are one loop, uh, only at one loop. Uh, I have two more things to discuss. Questions? Yeah. Please. So let, let me just go back to my question. I was trying to ask here. So for the massless mode, if I have the massless mode in the external lens, then RL would be two, right? Yeah. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. You have... So you, the, the, entire, the entire, the whole propagator goes as Q to the four. Yes. Amazing that this is not a new idea. Stephen Hawking in, uh, I, I don't remember when it was, in about 2000, he wrote a paper, which you cannot find in the archive. They removed it completely, I think. Uh, so it was called, Who is Afraid of Higher Derivative Ghosts? And he said exactly this. He said the following, that uh, it is not correct to s treat this particle as a particle, because it always comes together. Okay? This is not an isolated particle, ghost. This ghost always goes with graviton. And you must construct new quantum field theory which takes this into account. You say something opposite, but more or less in the same direction, I would say. Okay? No, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the renormalization of this theory. Yeah. Because using that, when I put, put in the k squared, then I would get a divergence, right? 
No, you have divergence anyway, but you power counting doesn't change. You you mean that, that, that is the part I don't understand. What he is saying is the following. We have army new square. Okay, we trade it to army new, uh, let's say psi menu plus psi menu, psi menu. Okay, introduce second field. Make it six, two derivative. Uh, this theory has only two derivatives. Okay, you construct for this theory uh, quantum theory, right? This is what you are suggesting. And you expect that something changes. Uh, if you do it correctly, no. But in principle, beyond one loop, I would say it is complicated to take care about it. If, if I understood you correctly. Yeah, Bec I was just saying that ERL in this theory, you said it is four. Yes, right. I so said. But then when Moreover, it is four. <laughs> it is four. Yes. So when I have a massless rational in the external leg, I will get a divergence. You cannot split them. This is the okay, problem. Can I try and so I think in your language, I think you can you can organize the computation that you're saying. Yes. And only from the massless part you will get uh, some divergences. Right. But you have to add diagrams with the ghost part. And with the minus sign, that then it will cancel. That's an equivalent to splitting everything equally, one over two to the fourth. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Ah, no, okay. Also clarifies that this is the first part, is that there is sensitivity to the, to the plan scale, really. Right? So that something comes in at that scale, that yeah. cancels, and okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the, from the general point of view, what Eduardo said is correct, okay? Now, if you want to make calculations in this way, you will have trouble, believe me. Okay, but, <laughs> but, but because it's non trivial, you, you have to do this. Uh, or something equivalent, you can do it for the linearized theory, for instance, but it's not going to be easy, okay? Now, uh, second, uh, I, I said I want to discuss two things. So, in principle, uh, in 97, we suggested another generalization of this theory, which means the following, with Asore and Jose Luis Lopez, okay? And nine, 97, yes, 97. So uh, the idea is that we take S2 prime, and it is like d for x square root minus g, and then we have uh, uh, some c mu nu alpha beta, and here we have p k. I will explain what it means of box uh, or n better n uh, c mu nu alpha beta plus uh, uh, r. P, uh, let's say, prime n of box R, okay? And this P n and P n prime are polynomial functions, polynomial functions of the same order, okay? And then you can also add some other terms. For instance, if your polynomial is of the first order, so you have dimension of six derivatives, so you are allowed to put here three curvatures. If it is uh, box in third power, then you have 10 derivatives, and you can put here perfectly well up to R5, for instance. Leonardo Modesto called these terms after killers, killers, because they can kill all divergences. And Leonardo and uh, Leslie Fracho, who he worked with him. <coughs> so uh, in this case, power counting changes completely. I will just give you the last result. The last result is something like Maybe I can use uh, well, Jessica printed it for me, so why I don't use it? Just a second. Here we are. No. Yeah, here. No. Why am I not? No, I did not put to. Uh, I didn't put power counting. So I leave it as an exercise for you, okay? And we can see the following, that if we have n equal to one, okay, which means that we have just one box, then divergences uh, take, uh, exist only for p equal one, two, three. So the theory is super normalizable. If you put three boxes, okay, then only one loop is divergent. Starting from second loop, everything is finite. This is amazing because 
Uh, this means that you can make one loop calculation and get exact beta functions, as we did it with Leslie Frachwell and Leonardo Modesto. We have some paper when we have be exact beta functions for gravity in this model, okay, at least for G and cosmological constant. Now, does it affect somehow the ghost issue? Uh, originally, I had this idea to make this model exactly to solve the ghost problem, but when we started to work with it, uh, Manuel and Jose Luis Lopez, they uh, proved the theorem that it does not work in the following sense. So if you have real poles, you can have complex poles, I will comment on this, then your propagator is something like P2, and then you have one over K square uh, minus A over K square plus M1 square minus plus A1, let's say, plus A2 uh, K square plus M2 square minus, et cetera, where masses are growing. So M1 is smaller than M2, smaller than M3, and so on. So our original idea was the following, that we can fine-tune the coefficients in these polynomials in such a way that here is plus, 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 and the last is minus. Then you can have last particle, which is ghost, infinitely massive. So intuitively you think that this requires infinite energy, which is not available in the universe. But this doesn't work because the lightest massive particle always goes with minus. So you always have the situation with graviton, ghost, normal particle, ghost, normal particle, and so on. By the way, the same theorem, theorem applies very well to R squared, to scalar sector, because C squared does not affect uh, so scalar. This comes from an infinite properties, or why? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So this, uh, this theorem perfectly applies to R squared, because you see, Einstein gravity has no scalar mode. It has only spin two mode. So the lightest particle, which you have here, scalar particle, this, this theory has scalar particle. It is coming from R squared, and it is this, analog of this. It is massive, but it's the lightest one. If you put one box here, the next scalar particle will be ghost, okay? Uh, Breno Gaccini, he is student, he was student, uh, defended one month ago. He says he was student from CVPF, but he spent in Zwizde for like two years working with me and listening to lectures and so on. So, and he um, wrote a set of papers. I am author of part of it and others are with, or him alone, he made very good paper alone, and with Tiberio, who is also my former student. So they explored very, very well uh, Newton limit in these theories, and uh, they explored very well bending of light in these theories, which is completely non-trivial problem. It was very, very complicated. And they explored also, we, we explored with him, the possibility of CISO mechanism for gravitons, because you may think the following. Okay, we are protected by Planck mass in this theory, but if I have polynomials, I may require that coefficients of polynomials are such that all typical massive parameters are of the Planck order. But the lightest particle, which you have, can be very small. The big masses can combine to give you small mass. And then you have observable effects from higher derivatives. And we proved that this is impossible. This we call gravitational CSO. It does not work. You can see the paper, and this is done. And so we are really protected by Planck mass, okay, in all these theories, and actually in these two, okay? And yeah, bending of light is non-trivial because uh, what you originally think should work, I discussed with Sasha Belay, for instance, he's a phenomenologist, phenomenologist, and he said, of course you must do this way, and this way is wrong, you can see. <laughs> so you have to do everything on the optical level, not with Feynman diagram. Feynman diagrams don't give you real uh, res response for bending of light here. Okay, I will just mention this. And also they, without me, with Tiberio, they uh, analyze the co gravitational collapse in these theories, okay? Also, the uh, last paper is very, very nice. I like it very much, their work. So, and the last thing I would like to say is the following. Uh, maybe I just make it very fast. So what we can, remember I started uh, with the following. I said that when we formulate the quantum theory of gravity, doesn't matter, in Einstein theory or uh, four derivative theory of this with many derivatives or exponential, there is always a problem of quantum corrections because we know how to calculate quantum corrections, but the question is, do the results depend on the choice of the gauge fixing? 
do the results depend on the choice of parameterization of quantum field? This is always interesting question because you say, okay, this is perfect theory. I don't care about Gauss. I want to calculate something, scattering of gravitons, okay, whatever you want. But then you calculate something and you see that this something is not something, it's nothing, because it depends on the choice of gauge fixing. So and in this case, you have to do the following consideration. There is a general theory, okay, in quantum field theory, that if you calculate gamma effective fraction for one choice of uh, gauge fixing parameters, or you calculate gamma with another choice of gauge, fi gauge fixing parameters zero, which is, let's say, simplest choice. We call it minimal gauge, uh, which is better to make calculations. Then it can be proved uh, at different levels of, let's say, mathematical certainty. The best uh, is uh, with battalion Volkovsky technique, I would say, that this is always uh, proportional to, to equations of motion. So this is d4x square root minus g in case of gravity. Then you have epsilon, okay, uh, mu nu, okay, mu nu, right? And then something f mu nu. And this epsilon mu nu, in general, it is uh, epsilon mu nu is uh, one over square root of minus g delta gamma over delta g mu nu. Not classical action, but gamma with all quantum corrections. This is formula for all loops in general formula. Now, and this is basically difficult to use because we have no gamma. We always calculate with some uh, big efforts. Okay, we calculate some approximation to gamma. So how I can check my dependence on gauge fixing if uh, <laughs> here you need already effective equations? The answer is the following. If we go to one loop, to one loop, Okay, corrections. So things are much better. So then you have here d4x square root minus g, and this is epsilon zero menu, f menu. F menu is completely arbitrary function, and epsilon zero is the qua classical equation of motion. Delta s over delta g menu. This is great, because then with this theorem, Okay, you don't need to do anything. You just need to collect results. For instance, let's take Einstein gravity. I will simplify things. Take, let's take S1 and put lambda equal to zero. It's very good exercise for you to check what happens with lambda. I just don't like to spend time on it because I have a few minutes. So then we know very well that epsilon zero menu is R menu minus one half R G menu, right? Correct. So, on the other side, we know that gamma, gamma is proportional to R square with different index, okay? It has four derivatives according to power counting, at least if we are interested in divergences, okay? Then, moreover, we know, let's put it deep for safety, okay? Moreover, we know that divergences are always local. So we don't need to work hard. It is nice because we have gamma div uh, 1 alpha i minus gamma div 1 alpha i 0 equals to integral d4x square root minus g. Here we put r menu minus 1 half r g menu. And here I can put the function f, and as I explained to you, f is something with two derivatives of the metric. Okay? So what is f? f can be, uh, uh, let's say, x1 r menu plus x2 r, and nothing else you can put here. So all your ambiguities are encoded into these two coefficients, x1, x2. So if we multiply these two guys, then we have the following situation, integral x, uh, okay, and now we have x1 r menu square, okay, and then we have something like x2 minus 
uh, yeah, here is uh, G mini, of course. G mini. Minus 2x2, okay, because this multiplied by this guy. And, yeah, and we have uh, minus 1 half x1. Uh, and all this multiplies by r square. So, situation is the following. We see that changing gauge fixing condition, I can change coefficient of Riemann's uh, Ricci square arbitrary way, just take x1 of your, uh, at your will, and I can perfectly well change the coefficient of r square. So remember this famous number 7 over 20 r minus square plus 1 over 120 of r square of Hoft and Welton. They are both irrelevant because you can remove them by making change in the gauge fixing condition. And this was first discovered, of course, with a lot of work by Karl Staras of Tutin in 78 by direct calculation. And then people understood these things are so simple only after, as usual it happens, okay? Uh, of course, if you take Hoft and Weltman paper incomplete with scalar field, then uh, things are much more complicated because then uh, the S matrix on shell is not finite, I would say that, okay? even at one loop because you have scalar field, and, and so on and so forth. So things are not that simple, but still uh, there is one uh, interesting observation here that remember that our counterterms also have uh, Riemann square, okay? And you can always write Riemann square as Gauss Bonnet plus four Ricci square plus, my, uh, minus R square, okay? So you we can see that since these two guys we can change by our will, the Gauss Bonnet is unique invariant part, gauge invariant part in uh, one loop divergence in quantum gravity based on generativity. Okay? Understood? Or it, I, I was too fast. Fast? Uh, what do you want me to repeat? Or not, Eduardo? You understood? No, you have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, understood? No, good, once again. So we can prove, okay, not we, I, maybe I also can prove, but some people can prove, that if you calculate in one gauge fixing choice, this is, which you like because it's simple to calculate, or in another gauge fixing choice, which is maybe very difficult to calculate, the difference is proportional to real equations of motion in quantum theory. This useless formula because we have no gamma. But if we go to one loop, okay, and make expansion in H bar, we note that this F function already has H bar. Okay, so here instead of this complicated, very complicated epsilon, you have normal classical equations of motion. This formula is extremely useful. Whatever you do in quantum theory, you should use this formula always in your life, okay? Because when you want to see whether your theory, whatever you calculate, depends on the gauge fixing or not, you just use this, not only in gravity, in any theory. So you take difference between two different effective functions, divergences, one loop, calculated, and uh, with different gauge fixing conditions. And you are sure that they are proportional to classical equation of motion. Moreover, each of these gammas has four derivatives of the metric because you have power counting. And moreover, it is local. Then you go to your, uh, you take your epsilon, which is Einstein tensor, you put here, and you see, this is Einstein tensor, and this is your function f. And function f must be chosen in such a way that your expression total has four derivatives and is local. So only two of these possibilities you can have. You cannot have anything else. So you see that you can perfectly well kill Ricci square and R square, but you cannot kill Riemann square or you cannot kill, better say, Gauss Bonnet. Why say that this is Gauss Bonnet, by the way? Because you can say that this is square of the wild tensor, but this is wrong interpretation because square of the wild tensor is something which defines for you P2 part of the propagator. Okay, spin two part of the propagator. And, and you change here by your will R mu square. So exactly this spin two part of the propagator you can kill. What you cannot kill is the part which does not affect spin two part of the propagator, and this is Gauss Bonnet. Okay, 
I was recently a referee of the paper when people wrote a huge text and made this very primitive mistakes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, you, you, you must remember that this is Gauss Bonnet, it is not C square or R menu square. No, it is Gauss Bonnet, which is invariant. Understood? I, I don't like that after my lecture somebody makes the same mistake ever, okay? <laughs> so this is important point. Oh. What means? Uh, if you will try uh, to calculate this for gamma 2 and use here uh, the equations of motion uh, coming from. Good, 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 good. I, I, I understood. This is, uh, this is, this question is first, it is complicated question, okay? And second, it was never answered explicitly anywhere. You cannot find it in the literature, okay? I can tell you how it will be, okay? Based on my intuition, which is very powerful, as I explained to you, okay? So <laughs> my intuition tells you that up to some extent, yes, because you have to do, if you want to do it systematically, you should e expand this guy in powers of h bar. Remember that f menu also has h bar, okay? Remember that. The divergent part is always local, okay? So non-local part of effective action, which enters here too, has no importance for you, okay? And this enables you to make an analysis, and by the end of the day, I believe that with, uh, this will give you very, very good certainty in your answer, okay? But if you do it, I mean, uh, properly, you should use this. <laughs> so, and in principle, I think if you do it carefully, you will see that um, at least at least part of two loop, great part of two loop, will be under control. For sure, one over epsilon square pole, the main pole. Okay, but if you want better function, you need one over epsilon, right? So for one over epsilon, you have to be very careful. But I think you, it will work by the end of the day. But I cannot guarantee, I said. Okay. This, the question is uh, always somehow in the air, okay? But it is in the air for 40 years, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's not certain that people tomorrow will answer it, okay? Uh, but in quantum gravity, there are only a few two loop calculations and only in Einstein theory. Nobody uh, calculated for this theory two loop because. Okay. Well, we sometimes do very horribly complicated things, but really complicated. But uh, here I don't see the reason to do it. I have one colleague now with me in Swiss Defora, and he doesn't know how to make calculations. And he won't really want to calculate this two loop. <laughs> but I told him, well, we, ha we have to sacrifice somebody so for that. <laughs> Almost literally. <laughs> so, yeah. So if we do the same for uh, this theory for four derivative theory, okay? You will, I leave it to you as an exercise uh, to prove that then you have uh, in um, four derivative theory, oh my God, I better keep it, why not? Okay, in four derivative theory, you can have the following. You can, you can prove that this is proportional to some f, number f, g menu, and then you have one over square root of minus g delta s classical s two over delta g minu. Okay, so the difference between two gauge fixing conditions are proportional to the conformal shift of the theory. Okay, we published this formula in the same paper when we introduced the second scalar field in '94 with Oscar Shikhsinov. But then I discovered that this was hidden in the PhD thesis of Ivana Vramidi, I can give you reference, it's very good, HEPTH 9510140. If you want to learn uh, uh, Schwinger David and many other things, it was brilliant thesis. We spoke to him, we drink something at night, uh, we spoke to him, he's very uh, good uh, guy, and then he got angry because we understood that he didn't publish it, and then he, a few months after, three months after, he put this to archive, which is very nice because I really like it. It's his PhD says of Avramidi. Avramidi. Okay, Ivan Avramidi. 
Okay. So here we are. I think I stop here and we continue at two, right? <laughs> okay. It's a view. It's a view. <laughs> oh, cancel. Oh, no, I think it's a to this. So, questions? Ah, and ainda tem preguntas. Tá bom? <laughs> I have one. Um, so in the uh, ostrography, in higher derivative in classical theories, uh, the theory is unstable to small instabilities, right? Sorry, again? In classical higher derivative theories, the theory is unstable to small perturbations. That's the... Yeah, the problem is that you can start with the small perturbations in amplitude. Mm -hmm. But if you take initial seed of perturbation sufficiently big, then it becomes big. And let's say at least goes out of the linear region. This is the class in classical in because classical I mean, theory, yes. in quantum if you analyze this in the quant like a quantum theory, the point is that we have instabilities when you have energy up to the mass uh, of this ghost particle. Mm -hmm. But in the classical case I don't think we can talk about ghost particles. So I'm a bit confused. Um... You can. Why not? You can, because your theory has in classical theory. In classical theory, you may not have particles, okay? You have, but you have massive parameter, which is the combination of kappa square and lambda, and gives you spin two parameter part, uh, mode, okay? And if you take propagator, which propagator is not quantum. Propagator is the uh, equation for the wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, in this theory. It has this mass of the ghost in the propagator. So in this, in this part of the wave has negative kinetic energy. Okay, so it gives you instability. Mm -hmm. And uh, in cosmology, it is, you can analyze it very similar to flat. But if you go to black hole case, there are some papers about this. And they are not, I would say they are not very conclusive because there are conflicting results. Different people have different results. Okay? And it's complicated. But it is not, uh, this stability is not quantum, it's classical. But the point is that it has to be in the order of the mass of the particle. It's, it's not arbitrarily small perturbations. No, no, be careful. Mm -hmm. This statement which I did concerns only cosmological backgrounds. If you go to, let's say, black hole background in the papers which I mentioned, which give conflicting results, the classical paper of White in 85 gives something very similar to what I said. But then Myung, some professor from Korea, he uh, actually uh, says that it is not true, and he has some different results which don't fit to this answer which I have said. Maybe, uh, by the way, this result for cosmology is not uh, exactly ours because uh, Starobinsky had similar result for De Sitter in uh, 81, imagine, for De Sitter. But nobody took it seriously with respect to four derivative gravity. He just, he is cosmologist, so he wanted to do some uh, study of cosmology. And he had no growing modes at all, okay? And we had in 2001, with Anna Pilinson and Julio Fabris, we also had no growing modes. Then after our papers, was a paper by Hawking, Hertog, and Real, they said, made the same thing. They also had no growing modes, but it was all on the sitter, okay? And with Felipe, we went to other cosmological backgrounds and we saw that the things are the same. And we also uh, used this, uh, we took initial seed of perturbation to transplantian, let's say. Then it blows, okay? Okay? Good. So we can relax a little bit. <laughs>